Hello there guys, I'm P792 here. So, uh, continuing my run of just talking about whatever random crap comes to mind on a Monday. Um, I'm actually going to do uh, three vlogs this week. Specifically because I decided on about Saturday that I wanted to talk about something I quite like. But uh, the thing I decided to talk about, which I don't know why I'm being vague, because you should have read the episode title. But anyway, um, the thing I decided to talk about has effectively three incarnations, and they're all very, very different from one another. So I figured today I'd talk about uh, the oldest, then the second oldest, and then... I won't say the newest, because it's, it's from like the late 90s, but um, yeah, regardless. So... Starship Troopers. So, today I'm going to talk about the original book, which is a very interesting read. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about the rather excellent film adaptation, which is completely different from the book, for reasons I'll get into. And then on Wednesday I'm going to talk about Roughnecks, which I don't have a bloody copy of. Uh, the TV show that... Yeah, I'll talk about Roughnecks uh, on Wednesday, but anyway. So... Starship Troopers. Turn the book the correct way around, Richard. I first read this when I was at university. Uh, I'd actually seen the film first, and I was vaguely curious to read the original, because the original is considered a classic, you know, won the Hugo and, and you know, God knows how many other awards. And uh, Robert A. Heinlein is very much one of those sort of classic science fiction authors who, you know, you, you should read some of his work, it's really quite good. Um, and uh, if you're not aware, the plot of Starship Troopers is basically, it's the far distant future. Humanity has expanded out to the stars, we've done all that kind of stuff. And we're currently embroiled in a war with an alien race known as either the Bugs, the Arachnids, that they don't really have a proper name. You know, I mean, yeah. they, the blurb literally just describes them as an insect life form which threatens the very future of mankind. So, you know, the enemy itself is actually kind of irrelevant. Um, basically, it's it's just a load of space bugs who want to kill us. It's a good standard go-to for a uh, villainous enemy in a sci-fi book. Um, basically, the same principles as armor, actually. Anyway, I might talk about armor at some point in the future. Um, and it's very similar to the Forever War, which I've talked about in the past, insofar as... It looks at this sort of massive, complicated war by following one particular soldier from enlistment right through to, yeah, well, I won't say the end of his career, but basically you know, it follows him from a grunt on the ground up until he actually gets officer rank. Uh, in, you know, in the Forever War, the guy eventually made it up to Major. Here he gets as far as Lieutenant, and that's the end of the book. You know, and you feel like if they wanted, they yeah, he could have written... You know, more in the universe without any major problems, but... Because it's not a terribly long book in the grand scheme of things. I mean, it's only you know, a couple of hundred pages. You know, it's only a nominal 14 chapters. But, um... It's a very interesting little book. Uh, because it is a very pro-military book. I will freely accept that. The film has a very kind of satirical, you know, war is pointless kind of edge. The book does not have that. So if you've only seen the film, the book is much more of a pro-war book. There's a uh, extended segment during Rico's officer training. The main character is called Johnny Rico, for the record. Um, there's an extended segment during his officer training where they're basically discussing, you know, one of your soldiers has been captured by the enemy. Is it right to start a war which could get many, many thousands of people killed to, re to try and recover that one soldier? And the book's answer is, hell yes. Um, which, uh, you can debate this point endlessly, um, you know, because, yeah, <laughs> that's a very dodgy moral grey area. I'm not gonna, you know, let's face it, there's a reason why a lot of uh, militaries involve, you know, the lines along the lines of no man left behind. Because they genuinely believe you shouldn't leave a soldier to be captured by the enemy if you can at all avoid it. And after they have been captured, it's your duty to do everything you can to get them back. You know, whether that's, you know, something as simple as sending them stuff to help, help them escape themselves. Um, 
or whether that's you know, organizing massive raids to try and get them back, or whether that's something as simple as winning the goddamn war so that uh, you can do that. Or it could be a prisoner of war exchange. You know, those things did happen from time to time in various wars. You know, I am a, I'm a bit of a medievalist, as you should know by my sword collection. You know, and during that time period, it was very, very common for knights to get captured during fights and then traded back, either for ransom money or they might uh, trade them back for, you know, just might do a straight swap. You know, you've got one of my knights, I've got one of your knights, swapsies, you know, kind of thing. And yeah, and Heinlein's attitude was basically, yes, you know, if you've got one soldier captured by the enemy, then you should be prepared to go to war to get them back if, you know, if other options fail. And I can see that point of view. You know, the, the, the book itself doesn't really shy away from, you know, the horrors of war. I mean, let's face it, the opening prologue, which is basically set few years later than, uh, the, than the actual start of the book. Um, the opening prologue is basically just an everyday mission for um, uh, the Roughnecks. Um, because he ends up in a squad call commanded by uh, Lieutenant Razjak, and they become known as Razjak's Roughnecks. Um, and, you know, it opens with basically just one of their bog standard missions. You know, it's... It's not even important. It's a raid. You know, they're basically going... They literally have bombs where they throw them in and then they basically scream in the native's language, this is a bomb, get away. This is a bomb, get away. And, you know, whatever the local equivalent of that is, for about 10 seconds before it actually explodes. Because the point going into this mission isn't that they want to, you know, blow stuff up. Well, they don't want to kill, you know, people. They want to prove that they could have done if they wanted to. You know, they're basically going in to blow stuff up and prove a point to get this particular group of aliens to stop helping the other guys, to stop helping the bugs. And, you know, it, it's very much about a careful application of force. Um, so, um, yeah, and one of their squad actually gets killed on this mission. Um, it's actually Dizzy Flores, who in the... You know, again, if you've seen the film, Dizzy is a fairly important character. In the book, he, because in the book it's a bloke, <laughs> um, is completely unimportant. It's just some random schmuck who gets killed in the first operation. And again, they go through the uh, palaver of getting him out, You know, even though yeah, he, he dies on the uh, boat back up to the ship before they can get him to a medic. So... It doesn't skimp on the fact that, yeah, war can be quite nasty, but at the same time, it appreciates that, yeah, these things bloody happen. So, um, yeah. So, in terms of the actual plot of the book, it's, you know, it follows uh, Johnny Rico from Buenos Aires, um, who's substantially less white in the book. <laughs> Again, I'm going to keep doing these you know, mild comparisons to the film. I will talk about the film properly when I talk about it tomorrow. But uh, yes, in the book he is actually, you know, he's from Latin America and he is of Latin American descent. Um, and it's very much a case of, you know, he signs up to, uh, well, I would say he signs up to join the infantry. Technically he signs up to the pilot program and then they run him through all the tests and go, oh, hell no, you ain't becoming a pilot. And they've run him through every goddamn test for you know every branch of the service, and in the end they basically amount to, nope, you're too crap for everything. Join the infantry, um, which sounds like a knock, but honestly, the infantry in the book are actually this ultra elite fighting force, you know, so they do have pretty high standards. Um, and the main thing that the book has that the film doesn't that when they were talking about potentially redoing the film, or doing a new film, uh, they started talking a lot about putting it back in, is, of course, the power armour. And I don't think Heinlein was the first, but he was arguably one of the first to really popularise the idea of power armour. And if you're not aware, I freaking love power armour as a concept. You know, um, classic example, the Iron Man suit is power armour. Basically, as long as it covers the entire body, has internal you know, mechanisms to allow it to move more effectively, 
you know, supplement the user's strength, then it counts as power armor. Um, true power armor can, is supposed to be basically sealable to be used as a full spacesuit, theoretically, um, or protect against you know, gas attacks or you know, chemical attacks or biological attacks or anything of that kind of stuff. So that is basically the difference between power armor and regular armor, to all intents and purposes. And power armor itself is just a wonderful concept. You know, and uh, again, in the book, it basically allows them to see further, run faster, carry more weaponry. You know, and the description of it basically, his comment is, you know, we are not a tank, but we are armored better than any pre-space tank ever built. Yeah, so that kind of puts into perspective the amount of stuff they're carrying around. And their method of getting around basically involves jumping everywhere. Which sounds kind of silly, but uh, you know, the whole point is, if they're constantly moving, constantly bouncing, they're a lot harder to shoot. Um, and again, different fiction writers are taking different principles on that. Uh, the Stark's War series, which also involves powered armor, because they're, they're fighting on the moon, um, basically argues that being seen is pretty much the worst thing for a modern soldier. So their suits allow them to camouflage to a limited extent, you know, it can sort of change its outer epidermal layer to blend in with the surroundings. Um, yeah, not to the extent that they're invisible, but to the point where yeah, effectively the equivalent of modern camo. You know, and uh, they're all sort of dodging behind cover on the moon, and you know, if you get stuck up in the air out in the open, you're probably going to get killed. Um, whereas here, the power armor is sufficiently good that it can take a lot of what the enemy can throw. Not everything, obviously, because again, Dizzy gets killed in the first chapter, or in the prologue. Uh, but it you know, very much shows that their armor is very, very tough. Um, in fact, it talks about three variants of it. Uh, one of them is the standard Marauder armor. One of, them is, one of them is the commander's suit, which basically has a lot more tactical uplinks and squad links and, and all that kind of stuff that a field commander needs. And I can't remember what the last variant is. It's either a heavy variant or a more sort of scouty variant, but uh, can't remember. It doesn't really matter. But the power armor itself, he goes into a lot of detail about it, and it's really quite you know, good and quite interesting. Um, you know, it also describes their orbital drop technique, because rather than using drop ships, they just drop in the armor. Or more exactly, they sort of get put in these eggs. To all intents and purposes, they are basically sort of egg-shaped uh, balls of ceramic stuff. They basically drop them. That burns away as they uh, go through, well, I would say re-entry, but technically it's entry if you're only going in the first time. Anyway. Um, that burns away as they enter the atmosphere, and then they deploy chutes, you know, when they, uh, you know, before they hit the ground, which allows them to orbital drop. And uh, in order to basically avoid enemy fire, the ship, you know, the ship dropping them in basically would drop, 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 and scoots off again as quickly as possible, rather than hanging around in orbit. Uh, which, you know, it, it does, you know, comment on the fact that this is ludicrously hard to do. Um, he actually makes a comment that 90% of the pilots in the Federation are women because women are just better at that. Not sure where he gets that particular idea from, but you know, again, in uh, the book there is a lot more you know, separation of the genders insofar as the mobile infantry are pretty much all male. Um, I certainly don't remember any mentions of any female troopers, and as I said, most of the pilots are female. But... You know, it, it does do lots of interesting ideas regarding the military itself. So, for example, uh, the guy behind the recruiting desk where you sign up is missing both legs and an arm. Now, that's the same in the film, uh, but in the book it actually explains why he's there. He is there to scare the bejesus out of them. Because the whole point is that if you're going to be scared off by the sight of the guy who's, you know, lost his, who's lost most of his limbs fighting, then you're not cut out for it. And they actually have an interesting idea, which is after you sign up, you immediately get 24 hours leave. And if you don't turn up at the end of that 24 hours leave, absolutely nothing happens to you. You basically get a note in your file that says, did not turn up, and that's it. It prevents you from signing up again in the future, but other than that, there is no punishment, there is no... You know, particular black mark against you. It's basically just an admission that, yeah, it wasn't a good idea to sign up in the first place. 
Yep. Um, and that's actually a reasonably interesting idea because it's basically a case of some people sign up, realize it was a horrible mistake, and just you know don't you know, don't turn up. And there's no point punishing them for it because you know you don't want anybody in the military who doesn't want to be there. You know, conscription has never been a good way of uh, getting a good quality army. If you have to sheer numbers, conscription can get the job done. I mean, you know, look at the way the Russians fought during the Second World War. You know, they conscripted so many damn people that didn't have enough guns to go around. You know, and that meant that on an individual by individual basis, their army was not very good. You know, because these conscripts were poorly trained, poorly equipped, and ultimately they died in their, you know, they died by droves. But there was enough of them to get the job done. These books, are, or this book, is very much about having a smaller, much more elite fighting force, so much more akin to a modern military. And that is, you know, again, it depends what kind of war you're fighting, and yeah. Um, of course, uh, you know, once he's joined up, you know, he's, he's kind of not entirely sure if this is his place, and then, you know, things are, are not going great. And then, of course, Buenos Aires gets destroyed and his family are killed. Or so he thinks. So he basically redoubles everything and, and you know, redevotes himself to the military and eventually ends up going in for his lieutenant's bars. Because he basically decides he, you know, he wants to go full career and he thinks he could become an officer. And his CO is basically going to sign off on that. Ugh. Sorry, my throat's killing me. Um, and basically he gets to uh, the transfer space station and he sees his father. And he realises that his father actually survived and his father signed up to uh, you know, fight in the war after his wife got killed. And you know, they're basically going in opposite directions and they have you know, this very, very brief reunion you know, before uh, they end up getting separated. And right at the end of the book, uh, he basically, you know, he is now a lieutenant and uh, somebody has managed to swing it so that his father is now his sergeant. Which... Not entirely sure that would work, but yeah, fair enough. Um, and it delves into a little bit of military history as well because uh, he, the ship he's on is the Roger Young. And if you're not aware, Roger Young is a real person. Uh, specifically, he was a combat soldier during the Second World War. And all, the reason that Heinlein basically chose to honour him specifically by naming the ship after him which is the same reason it's named after him in the book, is that during the Second World War, he was a... Um, you know, he, he was a, a private... I believe he was a private, anyway. And his squad basically got uh, pinned down by a Japanese machine gun. And he crawled forward, and he got hit. And he crawled forward some more, and he got hit again. At which point he threw every grenade he had on top of that machine gun nest and blew it up. Uh, while getting hit at least a third time, and he eventually ended up dying from you know, those wounds, but he saved his entire squad doing it. You know, so Roger Young was a very real, very very brave man who died saving you know, his squad, which is why Heinlein chose to honour him in that uh, regard. Um, but I think somewhere in uh, where it is might be right at the back, I think. Yes, there is a historical note there, which is basically the full uh, story of Roger Young. Yes, yeah. Private, 148th Infantry, 37th Infantry Division. Died age 31, Ju sorry, died 31st July 1943. Anyway, so yeah, um, but no, it's a very interesting little book. The actual plot's kind of irrelevant. It's much more a series of vignettes within the life of a soldier to all intents and purposes. Yeah, you know, because at the end of it, the war's still ongoing. They haven't you know, they they've won a victory, but it's not really that great in the cosmic scheme of things. You know, they've they've finally managed to go down into a bug hole and, and you know recover uh, an alien queen. Yeah, you know, but the war is still ongoing. It's you know the bump. You know, it's it's still a massive sort of uh colossal event and just yeah it's not you know some grand tale of humanity winning it's 
one guy on the ground doing his bit. And it is a very, very interesting little book. And I, I do kind of recommend you read it, even if it's, you know, very, very pro-war. You know, if you're a shameless lefty like I am, I can understand why you'd have problems with it. But if viewed as just an individual person's tale, it is quite interesting. Um, oh, one other uh, idea he basically has regarding the military, which I think actually makes sense, is that in order to become the Sky Marshal, which is basically the guy in charge of the military, um, you basically have to have served in both the uh, Army and the Navy. And you, know, you have to have a minimum term of service in both. Which actually makes quite a lot of sense to me, because a lot of times you find military leaders will have serious holes. Napoleon, for example, was one hell of a commander when it came to armies, but he was completely worthless when it came to naval combat, because that's just not where his experience was. So basically saying that in order to become the overall strategic commander, you need to have experience of both actually makes a lot of sense to me. It's also worth noting that the government in this book is a little bit fascist, um, insofar as the only people who are allowed to vote are citizens, and the only way to earn citizenship is to have served in the military. And again, the book explains why, namely that anybody who's inclined to use violence to take over will just join the military and earn a vote, and anybody who's disinclined to do that, well, they don't matter. Um, which is kind of a depressing view of it. Um, you know, again, if you want to criticise this book for that element, yes, absolutely. You know, that, that is perfectly valid criticism. But I, you know, I wouldn't espouse the politics in this book as, you know, a model to live by. They're really, really not. It's just an interesting book that I think is well worth reading. And I appreciate that... You know, I, let's face it, I decided to do this on about, I decided to talk about this on about Friday, and then over the weekend we had this this crap turning up in the States in, in Charlottesville with all these Nazis turning up, and yeah, Nazis go to hell. You know, but, you know, let's face it, this is not a book written by a Nazi or anything like that. You know, this is a theoretical science fiction book, and it doesn't pass judgment on the system he's written about, it's just the system that is. So I, I deliberately you know, told myself before I started filming that I wasn't going to talk about politics. So if you, there are many, many you know, works and treatises that criticize this book from a political point of view. Go read those. They'll talk about it in much greater and much better detail than I will. All I'm going to say is, as a fan of science fiction, and of military science fiction in particular, Starship Troopers is a very interesting book to read, and I do recommend it even if I disagree with a lot of the politics. So, that's it for today. So, tomorrow, as I said, I am going to talk about the Paul Verhoeven film adaptation. I probably won't talk about the other films because I ain't seen them. They're not supposed to be terribly good. Two is notorious for being really awful, and three is supposedly just kind of meh. I have seen the uh, animated film Invasion, which is okay but I'll, I'll talk about those kind of adaptations tomorrow and then on Wednesday I will talk about the best adaptation of Starship Troopers which is Roughnecks. So until then thank you very much for watching don't turn this comment section into a dumpster fire please if I have to block people I will and if I end up having to shut the comments down entirely I will but honestly I'm pretty sure my teeny tiny audience is way too smart and intelligible to you know, make that necessary. So, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next vlog.